You know, so uh, over the last few weeks, and we've been in this series, Walking with Giants, and we've looked at various characters in the Bible. We, we looked at Abraham, we looked at Noah, we've looked at Esther, we've looked at Joshua, and, and today we're going to be looking at a man called Nehemiah. And so we're going to be looking at his story today. But before we do, I always want to open up with a word of prayer. And so is it okay if I pray, church? Can I pray? Come on now. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. And Lord, we thank you for what you are going to do in your house today. Lord, I pray that nothing will come out of my mouth that you do not want me to say, but God, I pray that you speak your word, your message. I pray that you penetrate the hearts of your people today. May your Holy Spirit just dwell here and flow through here, and may you have your way in your house today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said amen and amen. I need you to be excited today, and so, because I'm believing that God is going to do big things in your life. Well, today the title of the message is, You Can Make a Difference. You Can Make a Difference. When, uh, when my wife and I were, were, were pregnant with our first son, I say we, she, but you know, I was there. I kind of made it happen. Um, and so when she was pregnant... <laughs> When she was pregnant with our first son, Judah, I was so excited. We were so excited to be parents. We couldn't wait. And so I was, I was with her at every, every appointment. I turned up, and we were just there together, going through the journey together. And it was no different when it came to the time of, of delivery. I was there in the delivery room, and you know, my wife was being hooked up with all that stuff that they hook women up to. When they're giving birth, I don't know what it's called, so it's called stuff today. Like, and so, and part of that stuff that they put on the, on, on, on the, on the women that are giving, giving birth is that what measures contractions. And so I decided that I was going to become a delivery nurse expert. And so I figured I'd ask the nurse all the questions. And so I ask her all these questions, and I'm like, I know what I'm doing Okay, great, you can leave now, I've got this. And so she didn't leave for whatever reason, she stayed there. But, uh, and so I'm there with my wife and I'm thinking, you know what, I can really make a difference right now as my wife is about to give birth. And so I go over to the, con- the contraction monitor and I start reading them out to my wife saying, get ready babe, this one's going to hurt, it's a big one. <laughs> get ready, another one is coming. It's bigger than the last one. (laughs) If you thought the last one hurt, wait till you get this one. I'm watching it. And I'm thinking to myself, Marcus, you genius. You're making a great difference in your wife's life. You're being really helpful. Like, and my wife allows me to do this for about 10 minutes before she turns to me. And she could have gone full New York. She didn't. She turned to me and she calmly said, Babe, you're really not making a difference. (laughs) Like, you're not helping. What would help is if you just come and hold my hand. That's what will make a difference. And so I share that jokingly, but the the truth is, is that you and I, we have been called to make a difference. And so we're going to explore five truths in the book of Nehemiah, how you and I can make a difference. A difference. And the, 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 the first truth for us today is this, is that God got a hold of Nehemiah by giving him a burden for the city of Jerusalem. What's your story? And we're going to dive right into Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 7. And it says this, In late autumn, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept 
In fact, for days I mourned, I fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O God, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. And what I want to focus on is that I love that Nehemiah had a heart for his city. He was all about his city. He loved his hometown. In fact, it says that he literally writes himself that, that he mourned and he prayed and he fasted for the people of his city. And see, church, I believe that there are two types of people. I believe there are Nehemiahs and then there are people of Jerusalem. One does something, the other one does nothing but stand around and watch its city fall. See, the people of Jerusalem see that their city are in ruins. They saw their gates destroyed, but they chose to do nothing. And I think sometimes you and I, we can be like the people of Jerusalem. When was the last time that, that you and I wept over our city? When was the last time that you and I prayed over the people of Corpus? When was the last time that we got on our knees and we mourned and we fasted and we cried out to God, God, be with the people of, of our city? When was the last time that you prayed and mourned? And fasted over your loved ones who don't know Jesus. And so my prayer for you and I today is simply this. Is that we will become a church of Nehemiahs. That we will have a heart for our city. And so I love that the book of Nehemiah is written by Nehemiah. And it's his story. And he chose to share his story to glorify God. And I believe that we can take inspiration with that. Because God wants you and me to share our story. He wants us to have a heart for the city. And so what is your story? In Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 it says this, And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. Are you sharing your story? Are you sharing your testimony? Your, your testimony is all about how God has had an impact on your life, how he has changed your life. Are you sharing your story with others? Are you even connected to your story? See, my story, really quick, is I grew up in a Christian home. I was a pastor's kid. But I still chose to make awful and horrible decisions. I promise you. In fact, like 50 Cent said, you could find me in the club, bottle full of bub. It's like, that was me. That was my life. That's what I was doing. And it wasn't until the age of 21 that God really took a hold of my life. And I remember walking into my dad's church and they had a guest speaker. And that guest speaker spoke directly to my heart. Everything that he said felt like it was aimed at me. And when it came time to the call of salvation, I made my way forward and I fell flat on my face and I cried and I weeped out to God and I felt Jesus just take all this pain, all these wounds, all these burdens, all these addictions off of me and I left there completely free. And it has been 15 years that I've been walking with Jesus and I've seen God... And I've seen God do the ridiculous. I've seen God do the miraculous. I've seen God do the extraordinary. And that's just in my own life. Even being a church unlimited was God ordained. When Christina and I got here, we knew that this is where God wanted us to be because we immediately had a heart for this city. And we've had an amazing opportunity to see countless people Get saved. That's why you need to share your story. Because your story has the power to change lives. 
your story. People need to hear your story. Don't run from your story. Your story is not insignificant. Your story is powerful. Your story is beautiful. Your story is encouraging. Despite the wounds, despite the scars, despite the pain, despite whatever it is that has gone through, your story is beautiful because your story is a story of grace. It's a story of forgiveness. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of how good Jesus is. Your story has the power to change lives. And so... If you want to make a difference, for you and I to make a difference, we need to have a heart for our city, and we need to share our story. The second truth for us today on how we can make a difference is simply this. Ask God for success. Jumping straight back into to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, he says, Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. I love that Nehemiah said that. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. See, Nehemiah, he prayed and he asked God for help. He asked God for success. And church, I believe that there's times that you and I, we don't even ask God. We don't even ask him for help, let alone ask him for success. It, it only took Nehemiah and, he, and his team 52 days to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. But did you know that before Nehemiah was even building the walls. He spent months in prayer before he took action. In fact, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 to Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1 is a span of about four to five months that he was in prayer. And I need you to hear this today because Nehemiah spent triple, nearly triple the amount of time in prayer than he did rebuilding the wall. How often do you and I pray to God, and when we don't get an answer immediately, we quit praying? I prayed once, and God didn't do anything. Never going to pray that prayer again. God didn't answer me. I put three minutes on the microwave, and there was no answer when my microwave went ding. Church, our, our, our strongest weapon against the devil is prayer. That is our strongest weapon. And so before Nehemiah took action, he bathed it. He bathed it in prayer. And so church, if something is big enough for you to worry about, then it's big enough for you to pray about. It's big enough for you to pray about. Preaching is, uh, praying is not our last ditch Hail Mary effort. It should be our first line of offense. If your marriage is broken, then get on your knees and pray. Get a babysitter. Go on a date night. Serve your spouse. Do something fun. If your job isn't going the way that you hoped it would go, then get on your knees and pray and seek God. If your relationship with your kids is broken, then get on your knees and pray. Invest into your kids. Go on a date with your kids. Quit giving up on prayer and get back to a place of surrender. That's where we've got to be, in a place of surrender. Could it be that God isn't working in your life because you're not giving God anything to work with? Could it be? That God isn't working in your life because you're not giving him anything to work with. 
God's like, I'm right here. Just ask. <laughs> I'm right here. I'm, I'm listening. And you're over here. I got this. Like, <laughs> I'm going to do everything what I want to do. I don't need to pray about dating him. I don't need to pray about dating her. And God's like, I'm s- still right here whenever I can work with you if you ask. And then when it doesn't go our way, we get mad at God. <laughs> We're like, well, God didn't answer me. And he's like, because you didn't ask. <laughs> How can I do something if you don't ask? Nehemiah spent months in prayer. Why don't we? And this is not me pointing out the speck in your eye. This is me pointing out the log in my own eye. Because I would be lying to you if I stood up here and I told you that I've never given up praying for something that I didn't get an answer for. Because I have. And if I really thought about it, that list is probably extensive. <laughs> right, so I'm not going to pray that anymore. <laughs> that failed. And I gave up. But if we want to make a difference, if you and I want to make a difference, we cannot do it on our own. We need God. We have to ask God for success. The third truth for us today in how you can make a difference is ask others for help. See, not only do we need to ask God, we need to ask others. <laughs> and picking the story up in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says this, early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. But I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Then the king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to God in heaven, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, Send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. I love that Nehemiah, he asked the king for help. He asked someone else for help. You and I, we are not designed to do life alone. If you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling alone, if you are feeling hurt, Depressed, suicidal. You are not designed to do life alone. But if you don't ask for help, no one knows. So if you need help, will you ask, please? We want to help you. I promise you. You have a church family here that loves you, that is behind you, that is cheering you on, that is supporting you, that will walk the journey with you every single step of the way. So if you need help, will you ask? Life groups are available. There's no better place to be than in a life group, in relationships with one another where you can be open and honest in a safe environment. See, the biggest, the biggest lie that you can fall for from the enemy is that you can do it on your own. He loves to get Christians with that. Oh, you're saved now. Now you don't need God. You found him. You found him. Now you can do everything on your own. The devil loves it when you no longer rely on God or rely on others. We've got to ask for help. See, the wall doesn't get built without Nehemiah asking the king for help and asking others to help him. You and I have something to offer. Turn to the person next to you and say, you have something to offer. Say it like you mean it, church. (laughs) One more time. There's still only about 12 of you saying it. Like... So we're going to say it one more time. You have something to offer. (laughs) 
You have something to offer. And in the same way that our hearts are to see you grow and to see you flourish and to help you. I'm going to ask you, will you in return help grow the church? This is me asking for your help. See, I find it ironic that we want God to answer prayers in our own household, but we won't do anything in his house. (laughs) We want God to answer prayers in our own household, but we won't do anything in his house. And it breaks my heart to see all that potential inside of you, to see all that talent, to see all that giftedness, to see all that ability, to see everything that God put inside of you from birth just sit and not be used. Because God has so much in store for you. You were made for so much more than just to sit. God has put it inside of you to make a difference. Please don't let it go to waste. The world needs you. The church, this church, needs you. This city needs you. You were created on purpose for a purpose. You were designed for such a time as this to step up and step in to your God-given moment. We need you. And so I'm asking you, will you step up into your God-appointed moment right now and own it? This is your moment where you make a decision to make a difference in your church. Will you do it? See, for some of you, maybe that's starting to serve. There's 168 hours in a week. Can you give God two hours of your time to sit one service and serve another? Maybe if you, for you it's tithing. I love that J.D. Rockefeller, widely considered the wealthiest American of all time, said this, I would never have been able to tithe the first million dollars if I never, if I, sorry, excuse me, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars if I had never tithed my first salary, which was a dollar and 50 cents. So maybe for you it's tithing. Maybe for you it's inviting and bringing people to church. This is something that we all do. That our heart for the lost should be so big that we should want to see this worship center packed out every single service. Our mission statement to take as many people to heaven as we can before we die, period. Has that just become a slogan to us? That it's just a throwaway thing that we say. Where's our heart for the lost gone? Where's our heart to see this room filled with people coming to know Jesus so that we have to add extra services so that more people can come to know Jesus. So as a church, we can take people from the gates of hell and into the gates of heaven. Where is our heart for the lost? See, God spoke clearly to our lead pastor to see a million souls come to know Christ and you play a massive role in that happening. And so will you help us, this is me asking you, will you help us reach people for Jesus? Will you help us grow your church? Will you help us reach your city? See, I love that Corpus Christi literally means the body of Christ. And so will you be a part of the body by help building the body? Just like Nehemiah asked the king for help. I'm asking you, will you help us by getting involved and step in to your God-given potential and what God has for you? The fourth truth for us today and how we can make a difference, how you can make a difference, is simply this. Know that there will be resistance. Keep going anyway. So at this point, we're about to pick it up in Nehemiah chapter 4. People saw him starting to rebuild the wall. And in the beginning, they didn't take it seriously. And they were getting frustrated when they started to see progress. So then they started to mock him. And then they started to try and get him to stop doing the very purpose that God had called him to do. They were telling him, get off the wall, Nehemiah. And we're going to pick it up in Nehemiah chapter 4, 
7 through 9, it says, But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps of the walls of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. People are going to be mad when you start living out your God-given calling. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Jump down to verse 17 in in chapter 4. It says, The laborers carried on their work with one hand, supporting their load, and one hand, they had their weapon. See, and I love that Nehemiah and the people were doing the Lord's work, but they were also ready for a fight. They gave me a plastic sword. They didn't trust me with a real one. I don't know why. But I love that they were ready for a fight. See, church, you and I, we have to be ready for a fight. Because I promise you this, the devil is fighting against you at all times. The devil wants to steal your joy. He wants to take your blessings. He doesn't want you to be happy. He is going to fight you. So you have to have your weapon at hand. Nehemiah had his sword. See, some of us, we fall for the enemy's lies, and we fall for the enemy's tactics, and we fall for the enemy's schemes because we don't have our weapon. But the Word of God is literally described in the Bible as our sword. This is your weapon against everything that the enemy throws at you. You keep falling for everything because you're not standing on the Word of God. So you need the Word of God in you so that you can declare the promises of God over your life, so that when the attacks do come, you can declare those promises, that you can continue to do the work of the God, why you attack the enemy back. And so some of you today need to declare that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Some of you today need to declare that God's miracles that you read about in Scripture are still for you today. Some of you need to declare that you are his masterpiece. Some of you need to declare that you are his daughter, that you are his son, that you are an heir to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You have to have the Word of God in you to declare his promises over your life. Because when you declare the promises of God and you walk in obedience, you can then step into and know that you'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant your enemies who rise up against you and they will be defeated before you. They will come at you in one direction, but the Lord will scatter them in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on everything you put your hand to. The Lord will bless you in the land he's given you. The Lord will establish you. The Lord will call you that you are his chosen people. And all the people of the earth will fear you because they will know that you walk in the name of the Lord. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. The Lord will open up the heavens, the storehouses of his bounty to send rain on your land and in seasons and to bless the work of your hands. You have got to have the word of God in you. So will you declare the promises of God today? There will be resistance. But keep going. Keep going. You've got to understand that the enemy is not fighting you for where you are. He's fighting you for where you're headed. Because he knows that you're dangerous. Turn to the person next to you and say you're dangerous. Because the enemy knows that with God by your side, And the word of God in your heart that he cannot stop you from fulfilling the call that God has placed on your life. The enemy's going to discourage you. He's going to distract you. That's why you have to have the word of God in you. To guard your heart and to guard your mind from what he knows will bring you down. We can no longer use our past hurts as an excuse to not do God's will in our life. So church, will you pick your sword back up and start fighting back? The enemy 
The enemy cannot take your wall down if your wall is protected. So when there's resistance, keep going. The fifth and final truth for us today of how we, how you can make a difference is this. Your situation can improve faster than you think if you will simply be diligent. Nehemiah carried on with the work. Despite the resistance, he kept going. He never got down from the wall. He encouraged these people and they finished it and they built it. And we're going to pick it up in chapter 6, verse 15. It says, so on October 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. You can make a difference if you simply stay at it. There's an amazing story of a young man who'd wake up every morning at 4.30 in the morning with his brother to deliver newspapers. And then after school, they would do another paper round. And they would continue to do this, even though it was exhausting. They would do it for six years. With the goal being of being a newspaper artist, at the age of 18, this young man finally got a job with a local newspaper. However, his dream didn't last long. He was fired for lacking creativity and imagination. Not discouraged by the setback, he opened up his own commercial artist business with his friend. Failing to attract enough customers, the business went under after only a month. Still not ready to quit on his dream, he tried experimenting with different techniques in his field. No one was interested. After another rejection, he decided to open up a second business. It started well, but over time, the business declined, and he went completely bankrupt. So now barely able to pay his bills and even eating dog food to survive. At the age of 22, with two failed businesses and bankruptcy, he gathered up everything that he had. And with his last few dollars, he made his way to Hollywood to try and make it big. Unfortunately, his early time in Hollywood was just as bad. Rejected again and again and again. And then at the age of 27, when he finally did have a breakthrough, someone stole his idea. And he had to start all over again. Another setback. Sitting on a train, looking out the window, an idea popped in to this man's head. And he quickly grabbed his, his notepad and he started sketching his idea. After two more failed attempts, where he was told that his animated character would fail, face constant rejection, and he seemed destined to never succeed, he knew better than to quit. On his third attempt of releasing his new cartoon, they added sound. It was a game changer. It was an instant hit. And in 1928, Mickey Mouse was born. That is the story of Walt Disney. <laughs> you can make a difference if you simply just stay with it. And I love what Walt Disney said. He says, all of my obstacles have strengthened me. You may not realize it when it happens, but a kick in the teeth may be the best thing in this world for you. <laughs> Some of you need a kick in the teeth today. <laughs> See, all of our dreams, all of our dreams, Walt Disney says this, all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. The dream that Nehemiah had to see the wall of his city rebuilt came to fruition because he relentlessly pursued it. So what are you going to do? Are you going to be diligent or not? See, understand this, ordinary people who faithfully and diligently and consistently do simple things that are right before God will bring forth extraordinary results. Did you catch that? Ordinary people, you and I, the people that we've been studying throughout this series, ordinary people, me and you, who faithfully, diligently, and consistently 
do simple things that are right before God will bring forth extraordinary results. See, you have to understand that your follow through becomes the key to your breakthrough. Your follow through becomes the key to your breakthrough. Will you stay at it? And so church, my question for you today is simply this. Will you make a stand and declare that you were made to make a difference? All you need is a burden for your city. Be willing to share your story. Ask God for success. Ask others for help. Keep going when resistance comes and be diligent. It really is that simple. And so right now with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're faced with, but I believe, I believe that there's people in here today that God gave you a dream. God spoke to you. Maybe it was a year ago. Maybe it was three years ago. Maybe it was seven years ago. Maybe it's even been longer than that. But you know that God clearly spoke to you and he put something in your heart. But you've given up on that dream. You got down from the wall. I want to encourage you today that I believe that God is telling each and every single one of you that has given up on your dream, get back up on your wall. I am not done with you. That dream is not dead. It is not buried. I put it inside of you for you to make a difference. And so maybe your prayer today simply needs to be that. God, reignite that fire in me. Reignite that passion inside of me. Reignite that dream that you gave me. I'm sorry, God, that I, that I stopped pursuing the dream. I'm, I'm sorry that I stopped pursuing the call. But God, today, I'm going to be a Nehemiah. I'm going to get back up on my wall. And I'm going to make a difference for my city and for my church. Maybe you're in here today and you're saying, well, that's great. But I don't even have a relationship with God. I want to make a difference. But I don't even know Him. And the good news is, is, it's so simple. Jesus died on the cross and, and rose again three days later, proving that he is God. And all you need to do to enter into a relationship with him is simply acknowledge him as Lord and Savior of your life. And so if that's you, I'm going to lead out in a prayer. And we're going to pray this prayer as one big family, supporting those that are praying this prayer for the very first time. But if you want to invite Jesus into your life right now, pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I ask you right now that you, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I repent and say sorry. Please come into my life, dwell in my heart, and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you that I am brand new in you. In Jesus' name I pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed still, no one looking around. If that's you and you just prayed that prayer, will you do me the honor today of simply being bold and raising your hand so that I can acknowledge you? Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. There's hands going up all over this place. Keep those hands up high. For those of you watching online, put it in the chat. Raise my hand. I'm going to give it a few more moments. Is there anyone else that wants to say, yeah, that was me? So proud of you for making those decisions. That is the best decision of your life that you can make. Lord, I thank you for what you have done in your house today. I thank you, Jesus, that you moved. Lord, all the glory goes to you, and I pray that as a church, as a people, we will choose today that you called us to make a difference. That Lord, you have called us to be a church of Nehemiahs. That we will have a heart for our city. And that we will seek 
and save the lost. And so use us to make a difference. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Thank you for watching the Church Unlimited YouTube channel. But don't stop now. Join our online family so you can stay connected with what God is doing here. Subscribe to this channel and hit the bell so that you never miss a service. And don't forget to share with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to impact lives around the world. Thank you for watching and God bless.